So we'll uh, talk about in the afternoon session about the team depleted water, but the team depleted water that is synthesized, produced in our body. And um, I think eventually physiology and, and what we have been talking in the last uh, uh, two days, it's really truly a um, exceptional journey to link and connect with so many um, uh, experts and outstanding scientists to cover the effects of deuterium in various biological systems. Now, my primary interest in is in, in cancer, and I'm, I'm, I am a physician by training, <coughs> and I'm a biochemist. So I'm going to talk about a lot of um, uh, connections with various diseases, primary cancer, and first what we need to talk about is mitochondria, or the water that is either in the cytoplasma or the mitochondria, and uh, what, what the difference is, and how the, the difference would eventually develop, or better word is just like how it would affect physiology or a cell's life or fate. So, as Dr. Agostino was showing that mitochondria in mammalian cells um, has a major and prime function, and that is um, to, cell, to keep the cells integrity and to, to be able to uh, function in a coherent state with adjacent cells, cells have to have intact mitochondria. And obviously, the, the water that we are talking about as matrix or mitochondrial water is the water that is in the mitochondria and the cytoplasma has a different water source. And um, obviously the matrix water is produced with the half of oxygen and, and hydrogen. Hydrogen comes from food and oxygen comes from the environment. What is really um, interesting about mitochondria is it, it has a double membrane and, and it really has no other transport systems other than certain cofactors and obviously substrates that enter the mitochondria to actually supply hydrogen and to consume oxygen. And oxyg even oxygen is delivered in a very unique fashion and that is a transport protein called hemoglobin which will actually take oxygen <coughs> to the membranes of the cell and in the cell it would diffuse through the membranes. Now, cytoplasmic water, on the other hand, is what we drink and supply through the circulation. Um, the cytoplasmic water is a mixture of uh, environmental water and mitochondrial water because mitochondrial water uh, uh, spills out into the cytoplasm and in certain species, uh, for example, in animals of the desert who don't drink water, their only water source is actually mitochondrial water or matrix water, and this is how they survive in the desert. For example, the camel is burning fat on his, on his long journey in the desert, or uh, reptiles or scorpions, they all have their own fat pad to survive in the, in the dry seasons, and obviously, one thing they cannot produce is ATP because they get rid of this water as a solvent, so they have to hibernate. So it seems that mitochondrial function and understanding these processes have very uh, far-reaching uh, phenotypic and biological implications. Now, where metabolic water really counts is, um, for example, sports uh, people, sportsmen um, like uh, Brett Henley, who is, a, who is a UCLA quarterback, and I have been spending time uh, with him before his draft because he was staying with us, and I saw his diet, and uh, I will ta tell you more about it, but obviously sportsmen depend on mitochondria, especially now he's at Green Bay Packers and he's number seven, so if you watch professional football, football games, keep an eye open for him, but let's, talk about his muscles right now, to throw the ball, he needs to produce a lot of ADP, ATP, and he has to break down ATP and, and make ADP in the meantime throw the ball. 
And when we play ping pong, which we did, and he beat me, he will need ATP again. So ev every movement, muscle function, and, and life, um, especially exercise, is really dependent on this mitochondrial function of providing ATP. Now, you believe it or not, we couldn't do this without recycling <coughs> metabolic water. So our uh, phenotypic or our uh, advantage is to learn how to use metabolic water and return it into uh, circulation. And with the returning or recycling water in the citric acid cycle, we can keep continuing producing uh, uh, this reducing equivalent, which will actually uh, shuttle hydrogens or protons into the intermembrane space. And from the intermembrane space, space as hydrogen comes back, into the matrix, ATP is produced and water needs to be uh, produced with the help of oxygen and complex four. Um, it really depends on what we oxidize. And another challenge is, which Dr. Agostino was talking about, is <coughs> when, when, when oxygen is, is um, abundant in our tissues, and you can see the difference between US uh, Navy SEAL divers and my family vacation in Hawaii, you can see all the excitement and the bubbles. Now, Navy SEAL divers, they have to dispose oxygen some other ways. And I think understanding mitochondrial metabolism will also give us the opportunity to branch mitochondria and produce water and dispose oxygen through water and we are definitely going to uh, consider all uh, possible applications of known mitochondrial metabolism. And we will discuss these uh, uh, possibilities. But obviously, the citric acid cycle, uh, ketogenic diet, water production, ATP synthesis, they are all linked with a very tight uh, uh, regulatory system. And that is, this is how mitochondria is able to function and actually produce all these very important uh, parts of cell function or, or normal cell function. Now in cancer, and Dr. Agostino was talking about this, in cancer, what we see first, and this is actually the first um, and most common finding in tumor cells, mitochondria are either not able to recycle metabolic water or mitochondrial um, water production uh, increases, or eventually there is no recycling of TCA cycle metabolites, so the mitochondria stops, and the, and and the water is is not getting recycled. So, as the result of that, what we know is the hydropic degeneration of the cells, where actually water accumulates, and this water will get stuck in mitochondria, and we we see very aggressive cancers developing. This is this happens to be a kidney cancer. Uh, in the meantime, cytoplasmic water is what, where we have a efficiency to deplete deuterium in these cells, and I'm, I'm going to talk about what the, the biomarkers potentially are for these measuring these processes directly in cells. But obviously, the water pools of these cells are very critical to understand um, how mitochondria function and how the DNA is stabilized in response to. Uh, substrates being oxidized. Um, <coughs> we know that actually mitochondria and the amounts of water that is produced in the mitochondria, it, it depends on the substrate that we oxidize. And, and fat is, is the most efficient in producing mitochondrial water or matrix water. And very precisely, of 100 gram of water, we, the mitochondria produce uh, 110, <coughs> one gram, 100 gram of fat, mitochondria produces 110 grams of water. And this is what Dr. Agostino was describing as how water production is related to the fat uh, oxidation process. However, if we oxidize carbohydrates or proteins, we don't have efficient water producing capabilities. And the reason for that is that glucose and, 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 and uh, amino acids or, or, or uh, protein components, they already have oxygen, which are in the way. 
of efficiently metabolizing um, glucose and using, uh, for example, hydrogens from fat where there's no oxygen, the ratio of, or the saturation of hydrogen per carbon is the, the highest in fat. So this is why fat, uh, oxidizing fat produces the most ATP and it also produces the most water in the mitochondria. So obviously the amount of the water would determine the, the, the number of cycles that we can produce in the mitochondria because there is an enzyme that recyc recycles the, this water, which is called fumarate hydratase, which was actually described by Dr. Sanjurdian in his Nobel Prize, uh, 1937, he got the Nobel Prize in medicine. One of the reasons was discovering the fumarate hydratase uh, process or hydration of fum uh, fumarate to form malic acid. And these steps are very interesting and important just to learn how the ratio of carbons, the amount of oxygen, and uh, the saturation of carbons with hydrogen determine eventually mitochondrial function. And actually, substrates just like octa octa octane is also a consideration when we go to the pump, because obviously short-chain hydrocarbons, or in that sense, fatty acids, are the best fuels. So when I fill up my Peugeot, I use this power, V power, and uh, gasoline, which has the most of the short chain saturated fatty acids. Now, why is the short chain important? Because this crosses very easily through the mitochondrial membrane. Actually, fatty acids that are saturated but longer than 16 carbons, they usually don't enter the mitochondria directly, but short chains do enter the mitochondria and they get completely oxidized and disposed in the form of water and uh, uh, carbon dioxide. Now, <coughs> we know that fat oxidation is more matrix water. What, what, what do we do with matrix water? We recycle it, that's one of the opportunities. And, but another curiosity is that actually, while the cycle turns over, and this is the TCA cycle, we're not gonna go into uh, much details of it, but there are three steps in the cycle which consume water. So it's not only one recycling step, but actually three steps of the mitochondria or the TC cycle use um, um, uh, metabolic water or recycle water. And one would be curious just to know why water is so precious in mitochondria that actually um, the matrix water has to be cycled uh, at each uh, cycle. And let's just focus on water exchange, which is the citrate synthase or citrate formation, part of the citrate formation process, and part of the aconitase or aconitate hydratase process. What happens is <coughs> water uh, comes in during citrate synthesis, and through cis-aconitate formation, water actually leaves the system and then water gets into the system. So the, the, the water is channeled to the next step and it seems like the hydroxy and the hydrogen groups are um, switched around. And this is coming from matrix water. And the next step, what we see is that this is the hydrogen, so it's the matrix water hydrogen that gets onto NADH. So it seems that mitochondria does not allow the water from the cytoplasm to enter its matrix, but it's actually switching its own, um, its own water and positioning its own water to the substrate. So it's, it's, it's gonna have actually the same hydrogen DTM ratio <coughs> that the mitochondria or the matrix has. Another important finding is that actually water is the first thing or the first uh, chemical compound that is getting replaced even in citrate. So it seems like if citrate gets shuttled from the mitochondria, it's gonna have metabolic water attached to it. So it seems like the main function of mitochondria is actually to use matrix water and replace matrix water onto the substrates that are being oxidized and by then, 
making sure that even the cytoplasm oxidation process will not have access to substrate uh, hydrogens or deuterium, but actually matrix water is what is uh, getting onto the reducing equivalents like NADH and NADPH. Now, what is also very interesting is the malic, malate formation or malic acid formation from, from fumaric acid. It's not only if you, if you mu mutate this enzyme, you're gonna have the most aggressive kidney cancer, for example, and this is what we studied with the National Cancer Institute, and this is how I become interested from the biochemistry point of view, how the term depletion works, independent from, from Gabor. Well, we worked with Gabor uh, before that on a project which we published, but truly my curiosity came from the fact that there's a natural um, process that replaces deuterium, and for example, while this carbon is, rep is, is, is getting oxidized, these hydrogens get on TNADPH. So obviously, and this is a shuttled, shuttled metabol malic acid is shuttled from the, side of, from the mitochondria to the cytoplasm. So it's not water that gets out, but it's actually substrates that get out, that carry metabolic water from the mitochondria to the cytoplasm. And uh, with Gabor, we just published a paper in molecular cell where we actually describe two very important elements of this whole biochemistry or whole biology that we are talking about here. One is that NADPH is compartmentalized. We did not describe this initially, but how it happens and how it results in intramolecular deuterium dis disequilibrium, which we already mentioned here several times by our collaborators from the Karolinska Institute. Obviously, um, these two components, the compartmentalized synthesis of NADPH and metabolic water use, and the intramolecular deuterium disequilibrium, and the different water pools of mammalian cells seem to be a very important physiological set of phenomena that we need to, phenomenon that we need to address when, for example, uh, uh, deuterium labeling studies are published in the literature. And these are very uh, insightful comments in response to this uh, paper which was published by the MIT. And I know these investigators very well because um, one of the, the senior authors is in the UC Davis system, uh, Chris, Christian Metallo. So we, we have very good co uh, um, collaborations, not collaborations necessarily, but we actually watch each other's back as far as commenting and putting things in perspective. But um, this paper is very important in, in the sense that it describes this function of mitochondria depleting deuterium on substrates which gets shuttled into the, into the cytosol. So it seems that <coughs> it, it would be very interesting to know exactly what is this matrix water? Why is it so particular, first of all, to produce it from fat? Um, and in another sense, why is it so important to, to replace water in substrates of the mitochondria? So why do you need to switch water around when you would say just water is water? Well, it's not the case, truly. Uh, we got so curious about it that I reviewed data which was generated uh, by the Hungarian Academy of Science, Science, Sciences by Dr. Forage and we turned actually the laboratory into mitochondria and literally it just means that we were oxidizing substrates. Uh, for example, flour, table sugar, cottage cheese, sunf sunflower uh, oil, butter and, and uh, pork fat just to see exactly what kind of water we can produce from these substrates. And that's what we did. We produced water from, from, from these substrates by oxidizing completely at 500 Celsius in an oven. Uh, it's called the Coleman method. Coleman has developed a method where you can actually oxidize substrates completely and then combining it with some transfer processes, we can match mitochondrial substrate oxidation and complex four function and we can actually transfer that water just like what any DPH transfer, what, what the water would like on any, would like, uh, on NADPH, we can transfer it to, to various other catalysts. Um, this, this method is described in the literature. I'm not gonna talk about it in, 
in uh, great details, but the, the process is actually capable of oxidizing substrates completely. And we use isotope ratio mass spectrometry or mass spectrometers to measure the deuterium ratio in water that is produced from these very common substrates like flour, table sugar, cottage cheese, or sunflower oil, which oil what our mitochondria oxidize. So um, um, this, this deuterium and, and, and hydrogen concentration um, is what we are primarily interested in. There's a calculation which is fairly known to this audience because you do the same analysis from various other biological or geological samples. But what, what is most interesting is that there are a scale of deuterium findings or enrichment in various food products. And let's start with water, which is oceanic water. This, which this is the standard, or this is the, um, the reference range. Uh, the, the, the deuterium concentration is 155 ppm. And if we actually oxidize or we measure the deuterium concentration in water that we obtain from cottage cheese, and the way they do this is they actually dry the cottage cheese, they uh, evaporate the water, they actually desiccate or uh, lyophilize it, so they freeze the water from cottage cheese and they measure the deuterium content. It's about 3.1% less than what you would find in oceanic water. It's not that much. If you oxidize flour, um, and it's from wheat, it's uh, again dehydrated, everything is powdered by the time we oxidize them. Uh, the PPM, the water that it produces is about 150 PPM, it's about 3.7 percent drop. If you oxidize table sugar, which is sucrose, and it's, uh, um, it's what, what we eat as table sugar, you're going to see a 6.3 percent drop in uh, deuterium content in the water. Now cottage, cottage cheese itself, which is dry after the water is evaporated, it, now it has 136 ppm uh, deuterium in its water and actually it's about 12%, 13% drop in deuterium content. So our metabolic water, our matrix water is, is dropping deuterium. And if you look at sunflower oil, which is a very common cooking um, um, ingredient, we're going to go down to 130 ppm. And that's a 16.6% .6 drop in deuterium content. So more uh, fatty or more oily your food gets, less deuterium you find. And then when you get to the butter, you can see it's 20% or 20.4% drop in deuterium content in metabolic water. And when you get to pork, then you're going to see 24%. And I think um, you can go even below this based on where your fat is produced. But actually, this is your metabolic water containing, contained in the mitochondria when it comes to NADPA synthesis. So this is actually significant both in, 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 in percent change and also um, as a source of reducing equivalent or DNA synthesis as a reducing equivalent would be transferred from water to NADP, the hydrogen, um, we, we obviously have to um, consider the significant drop is, is very important when it comes to biosynthesis of, of certain biomolecules including fatty acids and, and DNA besides others. These are the most important uh, in, in, in cancer. So <coughs> my next question was, um, mitochondrial water is deuterium depleted. We know fat produces the most of this mitochondrial depleted water. And this deuterium hydrogen moiety or, 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 or environment would show up in fat and DNA <coughs> by reductive synthesis. And um, the first question is, what would be the impl implication of this uh, very tightly regulated uh, metabolic water moiety in various biomolecules? And I talked about yesterday a little bit about m magnetic resonance imaging and fat versus, uh, versus uh, water relaxation. And, and we know that actually there are some tools and information that we can process. 
with radiologists uh, as far as biochemistry and data interpretations go. But I'd like to, this, in this talk, I'd like to talk about another very important uh, um, ap application, and this is how gluconeogenesis and the pentose cycle would utilize metabolic water eventually to control DNA structures. And for that, we have to look into biochemistry a little bit in more details, and I know it's very complex and complicated, so we're gonna go step by step, um, and we're gonna look at data from others to find out exactly how to use the biochemical information and gluconeogenesis to actually label or deplete deuterium from fatty acids all the way to DNA or, or, or uh, RNA and DNA, which are the source of nucleic acid synthesis, and what other pathways like the serine oxidation, glycine cleavage system would depend on this deuterium depletion process, especially metabolic water. This is the mitochondria here. This is the TC cycle. This is the citrate synthase. This is the conitase, and this is the fumarate hydratase reactions, which actually replace water in the substrates in, in and within the mitochondria, and we have low deuterium containing fatty acids, which we oxidized, and we learned about deuterium content. So let's say this mitochondria has about 120 ppm water, and all these metabolites or intermediates will carry the same deuterium concentration into the cytoplasma, so by the time malic acid is, is used, through gluconeogenesis, we can actually deplete deuterium in nucleic acids and DNA. And this is the backbone set of reactions um, that Marta and, and myself and Dr. Uh, Günther would utilize every day when we use tracers or when we use 13C uh, labeled substrates to follow and trace these uh, biochemical reactions and we would look at labeling from fatty acids into DNA and RNA just to determine the activity of these, these pathways. And I have to tell you, this is, I think, the most exciting, one of the most exciting areas of medical research, how to use labeled substrates to study uh, metabolism of, of sportsmen or Navy divers and how to adjust personally their metabolism for the most efficient deuterium depletion and the most efficient disposal of water uh, to handle their oxygen toxicities. So obviously looking at this very complex picture, we can t uh, kind of tweak out the details that we are primarily interested in, in, in finding out how efficient deuterium depletion is in a biochemical system. But what is really important for us now is that in tumor cells, this process is broken. So obviously we have to operate with a different set of substrates, for example, glucose, and a different type of water, which is cytoplasmic water. And when we restore, either restore or actually treat these patients with deuterium depleted water, that's when we have chance again to modulate deuterium incorporation into nucleic acid DNA and RNA. Um, the first set of reactions that I'd like to discuss with you is this isomerase glucose 6-phosphate, fructose 6-phosphate, and vice versa. Uh, fructose 6-phosphate, glucose 6-phosphate reaction because it's a, it's a reversible process and usually when it comes to a reversible enzyme reaction, um, usually what your teacher would say like, you know, there's no really equilibrium other than equilibrium change here, meaning that the equilibrium of the substrate product and product substrate is what regulates the direction of the, the reactions and the equilibrium between two um, metabolites is really not dependent on anything other than just the concentration of these two components. And obviously the deuterium load in these molecule or in these atoms is really not dependent on anything other than the substrate itself. In other words, what kind of glucose we used. That's not the case. And the first I would say um, most influential and, 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 and paper that we have had to look at is this 1999 paper from a Schlauher. Uh, it's from a German team. And what they are describing is an intramolecular deuterium disequilibrium. And it's actually uh, seen in chloroplasts. And it's related to this 
phosphoglucose isomerase function. So wh wh what does this mean? Um, when you look at an using NMR from bean starch, which is produced in the, in the chloroplast or the mitochondria of, uh, of uh, plant cells at the dark cycle, what you see here is that on the second carbon of glucose and fructose, there is a 40% drop in deuterium enrichment. This, this indicates that actually this enzyme, phosphoglucose isomerase, drops and depletes deuterium on the second carbon of glucose or fructose. And because it exchanges so many times, this process based on the C2 and C3, uh, comparing the, the percent change, it's, it's significant as far as uh, f um, this reaches almost 50%. So half, there's close to half less deuterium on the second carbon of, of glucose, and obviously, it's, it's, it's true of spinach. So if you eat beans or spinach, uh, the last thing that you would think is like one of the protective effects of spinach and beans on your DNA is practically this depleted deuterium on the second carbon. And I, I'll tell you how actually this protects your DNA from, uh, from, uh, uh, from building up in your cells. But practically, this is a natural process in uh, biology in plants to actually create a deuterium disequilibrium in certain substrates, in this case in prime, in, in sugars, uh, which will get oxidized eventually or get in, into DNA uh, without mitochondria. So it seems that not only mitochondria protects, depletes deuterium, but even an isomerase which we have commonly have. It's glucose phosphate isomerase is a, is a very common enzyme, and it's very preserved through um, biology and in different species. But it seems it has a, a, an ability to deplete deuterium uh, on the second carbon of, of glucose. Now, how this process occurs, um, there are many um, uh, studies that addressing these mechanisms, but it seems that the, the water in the, in the mitochondria or the, in the chloroplast in the dark cycle, it, it works like a mitochondria because it, it can actually oxidize or it can actually produce uh, starch based on the equilibrium of these metabolites. It seems that if the deuterium depleted water is present, this enzyme would exchange the hydrogen from the first carbon with hydrogen of the water in the, in the, in the media and we'd use the water from the media and would actually drop it on onto the second carbon of, of, of glucose. So it's, it's actually a enzymatic exchange of, of substrate with the media and actually eventually the substrate or the product will match closer to the deuterium enrichment of the, of the, of the water that the reaction takes place in. Now, <coughs> this is not the only surprising fact about uh, phosphoglucose isomerase, but, but the other surprising fact is that if, if deuterium depleted water is present, the equilibrium between fructose 6-phosphate and glucose 6-phosphate is not close to one, but it's three to one in the expense of, of, of uh, fructose, meaning that this enzyme not only regulates based on the deuterium enrichment of the water, the deuterium composition of the second carbon of fructose, but it also distorts the equilibrium between its, its substrate and products, meaning that this reversible enzyme is really not reversible depending on the deuterium enrichment of the water that it, it uses for, um, for controlling the reaction. Now, in the cytoplasma, it seems like the reaction is really not affected by deuterium depletion, and there is no deuterium depletion in, the, in the, any of the carbons of the molecule. So the next question, I think, would be just to answer how the second carbon of, of glucose, which is deuterium depleted, would protect our DNA. And what is the role of this carbon specifically in the DNA structure to, to, um, to, uh, to cause cancer or actually um, uh, uh, change the behavior of DNA or nucleic acid material? 
And this is from a paper from 1998, and it was uh, actually edited by uh, Dr. Noller at the University of California. He's at Santa Cruz. Um, and um, what they have described in this paper is that actually DNA strand breaking, or the ease of how easily you can break up your DNA, it act by hydroxy radicals, which are actually produced by radiating, um, uh, by radiation and s chemotherapy is governed by the accessible surface areas of hydrogen atoms of the DNA backbone sugar molecules. And they actually performed a very interesting experiment and, and this ex uh, what the study was addressing is that how these th uh, three, five ends of the, of the sugar molecule of DNA would be uh, sensitive to hydroxyl attacks based on the if, if this is a hydrogen or, a, or this is a deuterium, and what they did, they actually pray, replaced uh, one by one each carbon of the DNA sugar molecule with a deuterium, and they threw the, the PCR product into a uh, hydroxy radical mixture, and they were measuring how much, what strength of hydroxy radicals that are needed to actually break the DNA. And in some settings, based on the modulations or modifications of the, of the sugar backbone molecule, the fifth carbon of glucose or fifth carbon of deoxyribose was actually the most sensitive to this uh, hydroxy radical attack, which means that if you replaced hydrogen with deuterium, this DNA would just not break up as easy as before. And this has a major implication in chemotherapy because if we could deplete deuterium on this fifth carbon of, of DNA sugar backbone, we might be able to give one third of the dose of we are currently uh, treating the patients where as far as chemotherapy or radiation therapy goes. And this implication also has, um, uh, um, this, this fact also has implications in how to protect DNA from radiating uh, uh, damage. So maybe sunscreens are not as healthy as we think because maybe the sunlight has a natural threshold or housekeeping or, or main DNA integrity maintaining effect based on how deuterium depleted our metabolism is and how sensitive our DNA is to UV light sunlight generated hydroxy radical production. Obviously the implications are very um, precise and very um, promising to understand the process uh, more efficiently. You can see that actually of all the carbons, the fifth carbon and the third carbon seem to be the most sensitive to uh, deterioration. Now, how would the fifth carbon of, um, of um, or the second carbon of fructose become the fifth R carbon of, of deoxyglucose, and how would the, the deuterium depleted diet um, protect the fifth carbon of deoxyribose to actually control DNA sensitivity and DNA um, breaking or DNA uh, integrity? Um, I think it's easy to see how low deuterium uh, fatty acids or beta oxidation um, would control the DNA um, or would control the matrix water uh, 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 deuterium concentration or deuterium uh, load. It's simply because if we oxidize more fatty acids, uh, beta oxidation would, would produce um, less deuterium um, enriched water in the matrix. And by reactions that exchange water in substrates of the TC cycle, this deuterium depleted water will hydrate the, the substrate that can be shuttled from the cycle. Now, we know two of the major shuttles, one targets citrate, the other targets malic acid, and isocitrate gets shuttled and ketoglutarate gets shuttled, but it seems that the mitochondrial function um, of deuter low lowering deuterium on specific carbons of, for example, malic acid, it's also important when, for example, glutamine is getting oxidized because it seems that glutamine's hydrogens will also eventually replace uh, to metabolic water. So 
It doesn't matter what main substrate you use. It can be oxaloacetate or citrate or glutamine that gets into alpha ketoglutarate. Mitochondria will make sure that the deuterium replacement occurs before the, the, the substrate is shut out from the mitochondria for, uh, uh, for uh, gluconeogenesis. Or, which I find very interesting is that even though then citrate is shut out from the mitochondria for fatty, de novo fatty acid synthesis, even when mitochondria is turning fatty acids over, let's say it's oxidizing fatty acid and then it's shuttling citrate for de novo fatty acid synthesis, from glucose, for example, if glucose is contributing to oxaloacetate synthesis, then you can see that the citrate synthase enzyme will immediately replace the water in citrate. So even citrate, when it gets shuttled, it's going to have a, an imprint of the mitochondrial deuterium depleted water. So it doesn't matter what the source is. It seems that the first step of the mitochondrial beta oxidation and de novo fatty acid synthesis turnover, which depends on sub, uh, citrate, which is the, the only uh, process that actually provides this um, uh, uh, melanin coenzyme A for de novo fatty acid synthesis, it has a deuterium uh, replacement process. The only time when we don't have the ability to actually deplete deuterium in the mitochondria is the process that we know reductive carboxylation. And that is practically turning this alpha ketoglutarate process the other way. And actually, instead of using water, ketoglutarate from glutamine will actually be turned into citrate, which is the, the carboxylation process, the, the reductive carboxylation process. And that that process will use NADPH that is produced either through in the pentose cycle or is produced in the serine oxidation glycine, glycine cleavage system. And actually, this is a, a cancer-related phenotypic change when we use a reductive carboxylation and we turn the cycle around. So as long as the, the cycle is going into the late, late uh, uh, glu um, I would say the catalytic direction, the tomb depletion is, 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 is part of the process. As soon as the cycle turns around, reductive carbo carboxylation steps in, and this is very common in cancer, when there is no oxygen, meaning that there is no oxygen and there is no fumaric <coughs> acid, um, and there is no malic acid production, there is no water production, water cannot be recycled in uh, in through fumarate. And more importantly, when this enzyme is mutated called the, the fumarate hydratase, which was described by Albert Sengerdi, and the cycle has to turn back, meaning that it's, it's going to be a reductive carboxylating cycle, then cancer develops. And th those are very aggressive cancers. So it seems that f f um, this integrating the process in mitochondria, that is a deuterium depleting process, and also this integrating gluconeogenesis, from um, uh, carbons that are originating, low deuterium carbons that are regen re re regenerating or originating from fatty acids, it seems to be critical to understand cancer. It's not necessarily the same carbons, but these, the fatty acid carbons are ex in exchange with TCA cycle metabolites, and more importantly, the low deuterium content of fatty acids eventually will become deuterium depleted water, and that water starts <coughs> hydrating substrates no matter where they are coming in. So it seems that th this function of the mitochondria is really truly critical to actually um, produce, um, to actually produce uh, uh, safe DNA or DNA that is deuterium depleted. Now, how would the second carbon of fructose become the fifth carbon of, of deoxy uh, um, of, of, uh, of DNA or sh DNA sugar, if you actually just ignore the red dots, the, the, those are coming from fatty acid labels. If you actually <laughs> oxidize glucose first through the pentose cycle, then this carbon is lost, and, and Dr. Cascante was talking about this process. So the second carbon of glucose will become the first carbon of, of ribose. 
ribose getting recycled into glycolysis, it's going to end up in the, as the third carbon of, of glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. And using transkinase, glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate can actually control the tumor load in the fifth carbon of DNA sugars. So it seems that switching metabolism, depleting metabolism of deuterium, controlling this glucose fructose and fructose glucose step, and forcing glucose to go through the pentose cycle where the second carbon of glucose will be the first carbon, and in that sense, the last carbon of DNA through these carbon exchange, exchange reactions, these are the very specific particular steps that all are in the direction of controlling DNA in integrity and DNA safe, DNA uh, deterioration. So we have a threshold, a normal threshold of DNA deterioration, which is enough, sufficient for keeping the DNA and the, the, the isotope effects of, of, of deuterium uh, help the DNA to function the way it's supposed to function in our, um, in our environment or, or, or in our phenotype, <coughs> in, in our cellular phenotype, phenotypes. And also there's, there's, there's linked mitochondrial processes and also through gluconeogenesis, the main point is to deplete deuterium eventually in structural molecules um, which are uh, true of DNA and also nuclear membranes. Now, when it comes to nuclear membrane synthesis, one nuclear membrane that we use, um, one particular fatty acid that we use in the nuclear membrane is uh, lignoceric acid, which is a very long chain saturated fatty acid, and that does not, does not get oxidized directly in the mitochondria. That has to go through chain shortening in the peroxisomes. And we know certain drugs, for example, rosiglitazone, metformin, Gleevec, uh, Avastin, and a whole list of agents and drugs, they actually modify this beta oxidation and actually increase this beta oxidation without increasing gluco the gluconeogenesis or, or, or um, better to say, uh, new fatty acid synthesis. So it seems that the, the main um, a target of, a, of an effective anti-cancer drug is being able to increase this, uh, 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 of this fatty acid uh, oxidation process, deplete deuterium from fatty acids in, in mitochondria and control DNA integrity that way. Now, another important question that I've, I'm focusing on in the next uh, few months or, 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 or years of my work is practically how dietary fatty acid deterioration affects our overall health and our, our, our population health. I think feeding cows with uh, fish powder and, and supplements will actually deplete um, or actually increase the term even in fat, meaning that the mitochondria on a population scale is just not able to deplete the term anymore because the fat we are oxidizing are not really deuterium depleted. And it will have an effect on the gluconeogenesis. Eventually, it will have a, have effect in uh, DNA integrity. And as far as deuterating the fifth carbon of DNA from fat that is not deuterium depleted because of the food industry and the, the practices there, and obviously, if you eat sugar instead of fat, these dietary recommendations are really not appropriate. Using sunscreen is really not appropriate. Um, eating actually processed meat or food um, that is really not um, natural or not farm animals, obviously those all have the risk of, of, of disintegrating the ability of mitochondria to deplete deuterium and eventually they cause cancer. And the only um, tool that we have at that moment is actually lowering deuterium through drinking water or drinking water or, or consuming deuterium depleted water and this is where we linked with Gabo's research because that's another uh, very effective um, uh, way of uh, controlling DNA integrity. Now, I'm not gonna go through conclusions and summary in very details, but it seems that we understand mitochondrial deuterium depleting met metabolism and water production well enough to develop deuterium and hydrogen ratio biomarkers for scientists and physicians. And uh, uh, there is national interest. I'm, I'm not gonna detail those because obviously these are population scale 
uh, disease processes that can be addressed and based on this, uh, based on these initiatives. Um, Brett Hundley is, is my friend, who's a quarterback, and uh, this is what um, we, uh, I gave the same talk at UCLA and we visited the lab. This is a mass spectrometer we, where we actually measure the athlete's uh, uh, ability to produce uh, metabolic water and the substrate they oxidize. And interestingly, um, he, he's, he, he, he's not using drugs. He's a, he's a religious guy, so we prayed it before every dinner. And he, he's actually 100%. In some of his performance, if you go to ESPN and you look at sports science, this guy, in some of the tasks, he produces 100% result, meaning that he hits the target 100 times. He can focus very well. It doesn't show up in his ping pong game and golf game, I can tell you, because he hit five golf balls in my swimming pool. And I told him that you, well, you won, so <laughs> you're not going to play any longer. But this guy is a really prime athlete as far as uh, football goes. He's really a very um, excellent uh, uh, biochemist, sports biochemist in that sense. And he, he is really, truly a very um, conscious uh, sports uh, leader um, as far as uh, his performance and, and future games. And we are hoping that profiling these uh, athletes and their metabolic fingerprints, we are able to help them to uh, do sports without drugs because even drugs cannot really enhance any further the mitochondrial functions that we can actually uh, tune them into. So this is fumarate hydratase. This is what the water hydration process uh, takes place in this active site in this enzyme and this is what was discovered by Dr. Sandyer with that I just wanted to thank you for being here.